the Georgian Orthodox Church plays an important role in Georgia, having a crucial role throughout Georgia's history, having formed Georgia's social values, and, debatably, having influence in Georgia's political course. How has the relationship between the Georgian Orthodox Church and the Georgian state changed over the centuries? And, most crucially, what does that relationship look like today? This video discusses topics that some may view as controversial and sensitive. We will do our best to discuss them in an unbiased manner. A full bibliography is provided in the description of the video. The history of the Georgian Orthodox Church, which from here on out will be referred to as the GOC, begins in 326 CE, when St. Nino converted Georgian King Mediani III and Queen Nana to Christianity. Following their conversion, the rest of Georgia converted to the religion of St. Nino and, under the direction of Byzantium, bishops and priests were appointed to Georgia, with the head bishop located in Mitzcheta. King Vakhtan Gurgasali made the next major step in creating a Georgian church when, in 467, Constantinople approved Gurgasali's request to grant the bishop of Mitzcheta the title of Catholicos, thereby making the GOC autocephalous. King Gurkasali himself chose 12 bishops to be consecrated in Antioch, thereby bringing the GOC under the guidance of the crown. In 1104, King David Ahmad Shanabeli held a council in which he eradicated corrupt clergymen and replaced them with crown-favorable clerics, thereby asserting that the state has the right to interfere in church matters. Additionally, he merged the Archbishop of Chikondidi which was not only Ahmad Shenabeli's former tutor and mentor, but was also an influential leader of the GOC, with the role of the state's chief advisor. Finally, Ahmad Shenabeli founded Gelahi Monastery with the purpose of not only aligning Georgia with the Byzantium and Western thought, but, more crucially for Georgia, to indebt the GOC to the crown, furthering subservience of the GOC to Ahmad Shenabeli and his state. During George's time under Persian, Turkish, and even Russian rule, the GOC served as a crucially unifying force for the Georgian people in the face of foreign rulers. During this time, the GOC began to orient its traditions, holidays, and norms towards Georgia. The status of the GOC following the dissolution of the USSR followed the precedent of the 1921 Constitution, which stated that the church and state are separate independent. This changed in 1995 when Georgian President Eduard Chavartnadze adopted a new constitution granting the GOC a special relationship with the Georgian government and that this relationship would be determined by constitutional agreement. This has remained in the Georgian constitution ever since, including the present 2017 constitution of Georgia. A concordat was signed in 2002 between Chavartnadze and Patriarch Catholicos Ilya II which defines this special relationship. The agreement designates the GOC as the sole proprietor of its internal affairs and that the government cannot appropriate church property, including donations, funding, church ruins, and museum artifacts. The Concordat also states that the government will recognize diplomas from church educational institutions and that the church has the right to manage any educational policies regarding the GOC including who is teaching these programs, along with the program's content. Finally, clergy are exempt from military duties. This document predominantly separates the government from interfering in church matters. But what about the opposite direction? Does the church influence the state? Relations between the state and church were fairly mundane until May 2013. In early May, then Prime Minister Bidzina Ivanishvili gave his approval for LGBT activists to stage the country's first ever LGBT rally. The GOC called for a gay rights rally ban. On May 17th, which is the International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia, and was the date of the rally, LGBT activists were met by a march led by Orthodox clergy. This resulted in Orthodox priests and their followers throwing stones at police officers and otherwise peaceful demonstrators with a total of 28 injuries, including three police officers, numerous vandalized storefronts, and damaged police cars and public buses. The GOC made it clear that support 
or even tolerance for LGBT rights would not be allowed in Georgia without consequences. The Georgian police were widely criticized for not doing enough to stop violent Orthodox counter demonstrators. In 2014, in order to receive visa liberalization with the EU, Georgia was required to pass anti-discriminatory legislation covering race, language, gender, sexual orientation, and gender identity. The GOC demanded that sexual orientation and gender identity be removed from the list, although the anti-discrimination legislation passed by the Georgian parliament still keeps these terms Parliament removed the financial penalty for those who violate the law, thereby making the law relatively useless. Nevertheless, the Georgian parliament was heavily criticized by the GOC for still including sexual orientation and gender identity in the legislation. Church leaders stated that not a single believer will accept such law. To bring its words into action, on May 11, 2014, the GOC established a holiday called Family Purity Day, which would take place on 17th of May. Every year since, large rallies of Orthodox adherents gather in front of Parliament and at Sameba Cathedral to celebrate this holiday. May 2017 saw the first planned LGBT rally since the violence of 2013, but this was cancelled due to the Georgian government's unwillingness to guarantee LGBT activists their constitutional right to freedom of speech and assembly and to protect them from threats of violence. June 2017 saw the birth of the Tetrich Mauri, White Noise, movement, which is a youth-led movement aimed at reforming Georgia's Soviet-era narcotics laws. Despite months of protests and numerous promises from the Georgian government, even in the face of the constitutional court decriminalizing the usage of recreational marijuana, almost no meaningful progress has been made. In September 2018, the GOC voices opposition to narcotics reforms in general and, following rallies by the GOC, the Parliament of Georgia completely dropped its narcotics reform legislation. Also, in 2018, Arusta Viori, news anchor, made an unflattering comment involving Jesus Christ. The GOC condemned the news company and news anchor resulting in a proposal from the Georgian Parliament's Human Rights Committee to develop a law outlawing insulting religious feelings. The bill ultimately failed. Additionally, a Georgian condom company which used a cartoon image of Tamar Mepe on its packaging was fined by a Tbilisi court after Orthodox leaders complained that the company's usage of Tamar Mepe was insensitive. Human rights organizations accuse the Georgian courts of limiting the freedom of speech and expression in order to please the GOC. 2019 was an intense year for the relationship between the GOC and the state. First came the June TBDC Pride rally, the first large-scale LGBT event planned since 2013. The lead-up to the Pride March and rally was marred by threats of violence by leaders of Georgian ultra-nationalist groups. Often, clergy were seen participating in ultranationalist rallies despite official church statements condemning the violence. Tbilisi Pride was cancelled, however, a small impromptu rally was held near the Ministry of Internal Affairs. The greatest flashpoint came in November 2019 during the screening of the Georgian language gay romance film And Then We Danced. Again, clergymen rallied alongside ultranationalists threatening violence, including against the Georgian government if the film screening occurred. This time, the government reneged. In a press conference, the Georgian government reiterated that it must protect everyone's rights to freedom of speech, including LGBT individuals. This was the first time that the Georgian state so boldly defied the GOC. The screening occurred, despite protesters breaking into theaters and physically assaulting moviegoers and LGBT activists. Most recently is a controversial decision of the Georgian government to allow the GOC to conduct its Easter ceremonies during the coronavirus pandemic. Despite the parliament declaring a state of emergency, a complete ban on automobile and air traffic in and around Georgia, and numerous villages and municipalities on complete lockdown, the Georgian government allowed Easter services to be conducted and is even allowing clergy to drive around the country. This decision was made with two caveats. 
social distancing must be observed and parishioners must remain on church property throughout the curfew hours. The pattern above shows that the GOC has enough influence in Georgia to influence not only legislation, but even in some circumstances to determine who does and does not have basic human rights. Why is this so? The first answer lies in the high approval rating that it enjoys in Georgia. In fact, it has the highest approval rating of any institution in the country. Second, the GOC is one of two unifying elements in Georgia, the other being the Georgian language. From the conception of Georgia's first states to present-day Georgia, throughout the worst moments in Georgian history, the GOC has supported the Georgian people and provided cultural continuity and a sense of social and national dignity. Third, Georgia is overwhelmingly adherent to its church. Around 85% of Georgians claim to be members of the GOC, although the percentage of Georgians who regularly attend services is far lower. The unifying ability of the GOC can also be used as an extremely useful tool for the development of Georgia's democracy, seeing as that the GOC can, and often does, act as an intermediary between Georgia and other countries, and even between supranational organizations and Georgian citizens. Take NATO and the EU, for example. Many Georgians have a limited understanding of NATO and the EU, especially those in rural Georgia. Knowing this, the NATO EU Information Center based in Tbilisi has held educational meetings with Orthodox clerics for the purpose of allowing them to teach their parishioners about the relationship between NATO and the EU and Georgia. Additionally, GOC leaders have frequently visited NATO's headquarters in Brussels to discuss what NATO means for Georgia and the Church. This means that NATO, the EU, and even Georgian officials have a very unique ability to directly communicate with the Georgian people by using the GOC. One secondary example of this is with Russia. It's no secret that Georgia and Russia don't get along very well. By utilizing the Orthodox cultural connection between the Russian and Georgian Orthodox churches, the GOC is able to act as a critical intermediary between Russia and Georgia, and it is often insulated enough from the political process to be able to voice positive opinions and comments about Putin and Russia, which can help soothe relations between the two countries. The relationship between the Georgian Orthodox Church and the Georgian government is a complex one, which can best be described as a state within a state. Throughout Georgia's history, the two have intertwined their roles in Georgian society. The Georgian state and church are in a unique symphony with each other, created by nearly 2,000 years of cooperation and cohabitation. For more information about Georgia, visit our website, www.visiting.com. Dash Georgia.com. Thanks for watching.